Welcome. I'm Harry Elam, the Vice Provost of Undergraduate Education here at Stanford and a member of the Haas National Advisory Board. And I'd like to thank Mimi Haas for her vision and leadership in working with us to establish the Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor Program that brings visionary global leaders for a 10-week residency to engage with students, faculty, and our campus community. I'd also like to thank the Haas Center for Public Service for hosting tonight's event, and to all the co-sponsors, especially the Stanford Alumni Association, the Center for Comparative Studies of Race and Ethnicity, Open Exchange, and the MacArthur Foundation. Rick Lowe has arrived at Stanford during a historic moment, one that we will hope not only to define, redefine education at Stanford, but will help launch a civic resurgence in universities nationally. As you know, today we just announced, a, we, I, I had nothing to do with it, but <laughs> a new president was announced at, at Stanford. Um, uh, as you know, also this year we launched Cardinal Service, a bold university-wide initiative to elevate and expand service as a distinctive feature of a Stanford education. In the next five years, Cardinal Service will enable students, regardless of their financial status, to pursue funded opportunities to engage in full-time service for a quarter or more. Cardinal Service will double the number of community-engaged learning courses offered each year to 150 courses across all disciplines. In addition, Students will be encouraged to make sustained commitments to service and to pursue careers in the public interest through Cardinal Careers. Cardinal Service is igniting a recommitment to public service as a core part of Stanford's DNA. As Jane Stanford said, to prepare students is to, quote, have them be a greater service to the public, unquote. If there is someone who understands creative courage and applying your talents and services to communities, it's Rick Lowe. Rick Lowe is a Houston-based artist whose social sculptures are preserving and revitalizing cultural and historic resources in profound ways, and at the same time, redefining art as we know it. Mr. Lowe was appointed to the National Council of the Arts by President Barack Obama in 2013 and was named a MacArthur Genius Fellow in 2014. He is best known for his Project Row Houses, a community-based art project he started in Houston in 1993 that he continues to lead for more than two decades later. Lowe's unconventional approach to community revitalization has transformed a long-neglected neighborhood in Houston into a visionary public art project that continues to evolve. Lowe was originally trained as a painter and shifted the focus of his artistic practice in the early 90s in order to address more directly the pressing social, economic, and cultural needs of his community. With a group of fellow artists, he organized and purchased uh, the restoration of a block and a half of derelict properties, 22 shotgun houses from the 1930s in Houston's predominantly African-American Third Ward and turned them into project row houses, an unusual amalgam of arts, venue, and community support center. Since its founding in 1993, PRH has served as a vital anchor for what has been a fast eroding neighborhood, providing arts education programs for youth, exhibition spaces and studio residences for emerging and established artists, a residential mentorship program for young mothers, an organic gardening program, an incubator for historically appropriate designs for low-income housing on land surrounding the original row houses. Just incredible, right? While in inviting constant collaboration with local residents, artists, church groups, architects, and urban planners, Lowe continues to provide the guiding vision for PRH as he pursues his overarching goal of animating the assets of a place and the creativity of its people. Project Row Houses is an example of social practice art reshaping the art world. And in fact, the New York Times Magazine referred to Project Row Houses as, quote, one of the most original and ambitious works of art of the past century. We very much look forward to hearing more about this and about Mr. Lowe's other artistic endeavors. Please join me in welcoming our 2016 Distinguished Visitor, Rick Lowe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Harry, for that uh, great introduction. And I also want to thank the uh, Haas Center and the Haas staff for being such great hosts. It's been really uh, a delight being here, and, uh, and I've been made feel right at home. So thank you all for, um, uh, for making that possible. And also uh, uh, Mimi Haas and the Haas family for their generosity in, in, in supporting this kind of uh, uh, residency. Okay, so I'm gonna, as, as, uh, as Larry uh, referenced, my work, it, I kind of went from painting to uh, what I call social sculpture. But I just wanna say that if someone had asked me, you know, when I was a child, if I would be an artist, I would have said no. I mean, I didn't know anything about art at that time. I didn't grow up in a place that art was something that was available. And then if somebody had asked me about 25 years ago if what I'm doing now I would be doing, and I would have said no, because I had no, there was no framework for talking about art in, uh, in the social context. And um, so, I, I, so I've kind of had to you know, work my way through this in, uh, in, a, in a discovery mode. And so what I, wanna, what I wanna do though is just show you a little bit about how I started in the arts though, because I started in a way that was looking at um, trying to figure out how to push the boundaries of how art could actually impact uh, society. I mean, we generally think about art as being this thing that is, you know, it's, it's, it's personal, you know, artists produce it in private and people consume it, per, you know, um, uh, privately. But I was more interested in something that was more communal, something that is more social and that kind of, so, so I had to figure that out. and. Uh, and let me, I'll just show you this image because this shows the, the way that I kind of started my career as an artist, trying to figure out how to make work that went outside of the traditional gallery context and, uh, and, and really had a direct connection with community. And so what I would do when I was doing paintings, I started making them so large and big and I would build these big installations and host press conferences or do backdrops for Amnesty International, Human Rights Week kinds of activities. And I thought that was actually a, a pretty decent approach to, um, uh, to being an artist. And I felt really good about it. But you know, there are always challenges in our lives. And, and, and if we listen well, and I'll talk about listening as a part of my practice because it's so important. If we listen well, we find things that can turn our lives in, in interesting directions in unexpected places. So once I was sitting, and uh, after I did this great event of this work with, uh, uh, there were some police uh, killings in Houston, uh, 1990, and so I created this installation that allowed a press conference to happen. And, um, <clears throat> and so it was, in my mind, it was really successful. It, was on, it made it on the cover of all the newspapers and magazines in Houston and so on and so forth. And, um, and I thought it, it was doing well. So on the, but the art world side, I mean, they were questioning whether it was art or not. If you can look on the right-hand side, there was a question about, you know, is this art or is this somebody making points? You know? And so I've always had to deal with kind of being outside a little bit of the, uh, of the traditional art world. But that didn't, that didn't bother me when, you know, with the art world questioning whether it's art or not. But what kind of stuck me a little bit was that after taking this installation down and taking it back to my studio, there was a group of high school students that came to visit. And this one student was looking around and he was looking at all these paintings and cut out sculptures and stuff. And, and he was complimenting me, but before he left, he came back and he said, well, Mr. Lowe, while your paintings and sculptures show what happens in our communities, that's not what we need. We know what's happening. We live with it every day. So if you're an artist, why can't you create a solution? And that just turned my world upside down, right? To have a you know, 15, 16 year old you know, student just, you know, to just challenge me in such a way that I had to think about it. I had to figure out, you know, how can I actually address that? You know, how can I you know, look at being an artist that create things that are symbolic and poetic, but also have a practical element to it that actually address issues in a direct way? So I had the challenge of figuring it out. Fortunately, I, was, I stumbled upon the work of this German artist, Joseph Beuys, who in the 1970s coined the term social sculpture. And he defined social sculpture as the way in which we shape and mold the world around us. 
And, uh, you know, I, and he said that everybody was an artist. So I was really interested in that because, because I, you know, I thought, you know, that's what we are doing here as, as human beings. We're shaping the world that we're in. But how do we do it? Do we do it in an ordinary fashion or do we try to do it as an art form? So everybody really should be doing what they're doing as, um, uh, uh, in an artistic way. And so I thought, let me just see how this would evolve and how this would play out if I just allowed myself to be in the community and see what comes forth. And what came out of that was Project Row Houses. But I'm going to tell you, there's a few things about that I've learned over time that is valuable to my work that I'll share with you. And the, the first thing is about listening. So there's, there's a notion of listening. But there's also, you know, extremely valuable is, and I think this is where the most, mostly the artistic part of my work comes in, is it's that part where you take something that's a point of interest for everyone, but you, but you figure out a way to, to present it or transform it in a way that it's inspirational or is thought provoking or, or mystical or something like that. You know? So you just take an ordinary thing that people are just concerned with and you try to figure out how to you know, tweak it and twist it so that people can get into it at a different level than just the way that we complain about things or we talk you know, conversationally about things. And then the last thing is, is, uh, is collaboration. Uh, building partnerships with people that, that that allow these things to come into being. But the thing about collaboration, though, is not just for expediency, but it's also for that part that Joseph Boyce says, everybody being an artist. It's like when I pull partners in to work with, I'm looking to help them find their creative vision within the context of the work that I'm setting forth, right? So that they become artistic practitioners in a process along with me. They're not just partners that are, that are supplying resources and energy and support. So, so those, are, those are things that I'm really concerned with and hopefully you'll see that as I talk about these projects that I've worked on over time. Now, the idea of listening, you know, people think generally, I mean, listening is, a, is something that's become very popular nowadays. I mean, everybody understands, oh, you got to listen, you got to listen. And, uh, you know, we talk about community meetings and so on and so forth. And I've, and I've, I've had my, I've been involved in my share of community meetings. And, but, you know, I also think of things like, you know, how do you, how do you find those one-on-one -on -one moments? You know, how do you find, how do you, how do you, how do you listen in ways to people when they don't know that you're listening? How do you craft a structure through which that happens? Well, I mean, if you're walking down the street and you're interviewing people, they're, you know, they're going to they're respond to you in a particular way. But if you're playing games with them, if you're playing dominoes or cards or something, or you're eating with them or whatever, then, then there's a more natural process of things coming out. But the other thing I say about listening, too, though, is some of my best listening is done with my eyes, right? It's what you see. Because sometimes what you see can tell you much more than what people are willing to say to you uh, uh, in, in, in conversation. So, so listening is, is a big part. But you can also, you can use as many, many, many strategies as you like for listening. But if there's not an honest intent to really listen, you won't hear. You know, and, I, and I learned that from time to time myself in situations where I'm working with people and I say that I'm listening, but then I can look back and say, you know, I really didn't hear them. And people know when you don't hear them. So that's a, it's something that I'm, I'm constantly having to, uh, uh, to work on myself. Now, <clears throat> so with Project Row Houses, the challenge was to take something that was, you know, I mean, it's, people talked about shotgun houses and they talked about them as a point of interest, but how could you take something that really was a point of interest from a negative standpoint, you know, and turn it into something positive. You have to find something inspirational. And so for me, it was easy enough for me to find uh, the works of this artist, John Biggers, who, contrary to what everybody else was saying about shotgun houses, you know, thinking about them as ghetto slum housing and so on and so forth, this guy was actually glorifying them. And, um, and so, so it was my, it gave me the opportunity to think about, you know, how do I fuse the, uh, the, the beauty and the articulation of the shotgun house that John Biggers talked about uh, with these little old shotgun houses and, uh, and, and make it something that is, 
that is not just a point of interest, but it's something that's inspiring to people, that we can build around. We can, we can kind of, you know, we can move people through a process that, that makes beauty within a neighborhood. And so starting, that, that set up a process through which you could begin collaborating and, and, and working with people to think about the meaning of home, the meaning of home, uh, what it means to live in a community, and so on and so forth. So one of those partnerships that I started out was with Rice University School of Architecture, in which we've been working together for nearly 20 years of exploring you know, the shotgun house. You know, how does it relate from a historical standpoint, but also what does it mean you know, in, the, in the current context? You know, and how does it live going forward into the future? And so these are just some examples of designs of uh, houses that we've been producing and so on and so forth. But it's not just you know, artists and designers that, that, that can be creative and that can practice the kind of social sculpture in, on, in a community level. So I'll tell you a quick story is that we had a, uh, there was a, a uh, uh, president of a corporation, it's called U.S. Homes Corporation at the time, one of the largest home builders uh, in the country. And the, uh, the president lived in Houston. He, uh, he was interested in Project Row Houses uh, from a philanthropic standpoint. But one day, he came to us because we had these houses and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do with them because we had these artist programs happening and we had education programs happening. And we said we should do housing. But instead of doing artist housing, someone said we should do housing for sing uh, single mothers. And so we developed this transitional housing program for single mothers. As we were developing the program, we were trying to figure out, though, how do you make that inspiring and, and find some magic in just housing? I mean, that's just, you know, that it's so essential. How do you, how do you find something that's, that's mystical about it? And so this guy came back to us and said, well, you know, every year we generally spend somewhere around you know, $500,000 on doing something that we call the home show. We'll take a big house in the suburbs and we put all the fixtures and all that stuff in. It's a value of about, you know, $500,000. He said, why don't we take those resources and we do the interior of these houses for your Young Mothers program? And they pulled in interior designers and so on and so forth. And they actually moved this, he actually moved that part of our program, right? of a young mother's program and pushed it into the, the boundaries of what we called an artistic act, right? Where, where it was not only just that the, um, uh, I mean, the houses were designed in a way that pushed the boundaries of what people thought was possible with these little, little houses. And it also was also fed into the programming for the young mothers. How do you do something that, that creates something that's aspirational for the people that are living there? And so that's what that program, uh, is all about, and uh, and it's led to a broader effort of a, you know a larger housing program. We started out with you know six houses, transitional houses for sing single mothers. That is now we have about 70 plus uh, units of housing. That's that's mostly rentals, and uh, and so as we've continued to move through our our um, our development, art has always been at the center of it. And we try to find ways that we can, uh, we can inspire our partners, our collaborators, to th help us think creatively. I mean, let's not do this the way that everybody else is doing it. Let's figure out new ways, new forms, new models of, uh, of doing the work that we need to do. And so, <clears throat> so artists play a, a key role in that. We, we have a program that brings in different artists every six months. Uh, they're coming in and they're teaching us different things. You know, they're, uh, on the left-hand side, top left-hand side, there's an artist that did a program after uh, Hurricane Katrina, creating an environment for people to do rituals, uh, or things that they would, uh, to come together after uh, Katrina. The lower left, artists were helping us with gardening. So they started growing things within the houses and attaching them to the exterior of the building so that people could get them out into the neighborhood to green the neighborhood. Uh, upper right-hand side, this is before the digital uh, age really you know, hit, and uh, uh, he had disposable cameras, and he gave them to people in the neighborhood and asked them to document their own neighborhood so that he could create an archive of the neighborhood through the eyes and vision of the people who lived there. And, uh, and then just things where, on the lower right-hand side, where you know, artists are having dinners with people from different walks of life. So it's a, they, they keep, artists help us 
you know, keep things fresh and keep looking for ways to explore. Those that, those that I just showed you before were more kind of on a smaller scale, but then these are some that are larger scale. Artists came to us looking at doing a food co-op uh, because there's not places that you can get uh, fresh foods uh, uh, in, in, in our area. There's also an online radio uh, program that we're incubating, and we're incubating these in commercial spaces that we're trying to uh, anchor and solidify those, those structures as being the platform through which we could start developing uh, the, additional, um, the additional real estate in our, in our area. And so over time, we've ended up developing what we, um, yeah, we've, we've ended up developing basically a neighborhood that we like to say that you know, it looks to the past, uh, we, uh, honoring the history, but we're also very much in the presence of where we are. You know, we're, 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 we're in a modern society and we're trying to figure out, you know, what's that link to get us from, you know, where we are now into the future. But really thinking about just the whole spectrum of life, you know, that you, that you, you don't throw away your past and you are in the presence, but you're also thinking about the future. How do you get there? Now, our future have us faced with some very serious challenges, right? From uh, you know real estate values going up in a three-year period from you know about thirteen dollars a square foot to over fifty dollars a square foot, and uh, and so they're they're you know townhomes just growing throughout our neighborhood, can, can just all over the place. And as you can see in the upper left-hand side, you know people in the community sit and they watch. They sit and they watch this, and it's demoralizing for folks. But on the other hand, you know. We're, our goal is to combat that and to create you know, something that is inspiring in a, in a process through which give people hope that there's a place for them within the community as we go forward. And so we're currently, very exciting process that we're in with, uh, uh, with all of our local universities in Houston, the University of Houston, Rice University, but also we have MIT that's there working with us on looking at kind of strategies in terms of how do we uh, take the assets of the churches, the nonprofits, the city, and so on and so forth, to actually create a balance to the development of the market. And it's going to be a really interesting, interesting process. We're very excited about that. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to show you a, another project that is uh, that's very different and has a different uh, uh, context, but equally exciting. In that, <clears throat> this is a this is in Dallas. It's called Vickery, Vickery Meadow. I was invited by the museum to come there and, uh, and do uh, a project with them out in one of their communities. Someone told me about Vickery Meadow, and they took me there to see it, and it's a very densely populated area with uh, lots of rental houses. Now, the images that you see on the right-hand side are images that are reflective of the glory days of the neighborhood, and there's still some places that are trying to hold on to that, you know, apartment home living, very garden apartment style. It was built in the 19, this neighborhood was built in the 1970s, and it was mostly young professionals, mostly white, that lived there. And, um, but over time, depreciation, lower income people start moving in, families, and so on and so forth. So by the time, you know, I'm there, this is kind of, what I'm seeing and I'm hearing about the neighborhood, right? On the, on the one hand, you know, people are just talking about the, the crime, the crime, the crime, and you see it on the streets. People don't have to tell you about it. You can see it. I mean, these are just images that I, I took, you know, within the first, you know, few weeks of just being there visiting. There were always this police presence. But the other thing that was going on there was there were all these people from all walks of life. It was pretty amazing. I hadn't seen that uh, in, in the South that way, in such a dense, densely populated area. And then I found the history of it, how it came to be that way, was that because there was such a large uh, number of apartment houses, the International Refugee Committee selected that neighborhood as a place to place refugees. And so, so you would see people walking down the street from, you know, Bhutan, from Iraq, from you know, parts of Central South America, from parts of you know, Northern Africa, all over the place. It's just amazing. And, uh, but they're in this neighborhood that has been identified as a place that has pretty much no value 
other than, and, and its identity is basically that it's all violence and, and crime. And so, once again, so how do you take this thing that is a topic of conversation, you know, and pull it into something that is in, inspirational and poetic in some way that can inspire people to kind of uh, work with change? So what I ended up doing after a long period of time of, of conversing and being in that community, it hit me one day is that it is the cultural diversity that is the charm there. You know, so how do you, how do you wrap that around? How do, you, how do you present that in a way that, that celebrates it? And so we did something very simple. I pulled together my, my uh, partners there and we, we decided that we would have cultural festivals. Something that's very simple, in the middle of the neighborhood. Um, and, but the challenge though that we faced was the museum folks and a lot of the folks from the outside said, you can't do that because nobody's gonna go. You know, nobody, and people inside were saying, well, people are not gonna come together. People are scared, it's too, there's too much crime. People don't wanna get together. And it was, so we said, we're gonna try it. And we started with a, a food event that we call the Lucky Pot. And, uh, and we, we wanted to get different groups from different cultures to bring uh, foods uh, to this market, a little f cultural festival. And when we did that, the most amazing thing happened, right? There were people that just showed up from all, I mean, they were just coming, you know, from inside the neighborhood, outside the neighborhood. They were moving, moving in, and, and it, was, it created such an incredible dynamic. I remember once, I, I remember after the first event, there was a young African-American uh, man who, who he was, you know, probably, he kind of wanted to act like he was a part of a gang, you know, and he walked through when we were getting set up, and he was like, oh, y'all don't know what y'all are doing, you know, and nobody wants what y'all are doing out here, and so on and so forth, and he had, didn't have a shirt on, and he was all gangstered out, you know. And after we did this event, we were cleaning up. It was maybe like 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock at night, and somebody knocked at the door of the apartment where we were housing Seth, and, uh, and we opened the door, and it was him, and he came back, and he had on a shirt, and he was, you know, kind of more, res he was all dressed up, and he says, you know, I just wanted to come back and say, I don't know what y'all did, but nobody's ever done anything like that in our community. And he was, you know, he was completely blown away by it. He said, I didn't come, but I live right across the street, and I could see it, and I've never seen anything like this before. And it was, it was just interesting, and he became one of the, the, the biggest proponents of the project as we went along. And in fact, he was the one who encouraged us to do another thing that people said that wouldn't work, which was to add talent shows into our, our markets and stuff. And, and we did do this, we, we start, we, and the, 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 the markets just continued to grow. And, um, uh, and uh, the, the talent show was pretty amazing because we had you know, so many folks that signed up for it. The, the range was from, you know, um, a little, you know, maybe, I think she was an 18-month-old little girl from Somalia to an 86-year-old white guy doing a hokey pokey. And so, and everything in between there, right? So you have, you know, Bhutanese dancers, you have, you know, uh, drummers, you had all kinds of people, and the, and the beauty of it was that everybody was sitting there to wait for their culture to do their thing, so they were seeing the others uh, in the process. Now, so, so these market things were happening really well, but we also wanted to do some things that, that went outward into the community on, uh, that, was, that sustained itself in between the market times. And, um, and I was talking to a friend of mine, Mark Bradford, in, who's in LA, and he was talking about an exhibition, exhibition he was having at a gallery in London called White Cube. And, and Mark was, you know, he was pretty excited about it. He was like, this is my first show there, and, uh, and you, know, you know, some of my work's gonna be priced above a million dollars. And I'm thinking, Oh my, you know, he was like, and we talked about it, he's like, he's like, well, you know, this white cube thing, you know, they've really got it figured out, you know, you just, to commercialize, you just make this, it's just, you get all the stuff out, and it's just a cube, white cube, just like the pedestal, you know, you put it on a pedestal, raise the value, you put it in a white cube, you raise the value, so, so I, so I, so I decided, I said, well, you know what, well, if that's the case, we need white cubes in Dallas, <laughs> in Vickery Meadow. And so I went back and I talked to some architects and I said, you know, I have this idea. I want to do these exhibition spaces and I want them to be something that is uh, that's just very simple, but we could do exhibitions of people in the community. And so they came back with some very simple 
designs. And, uh, and so we have, you know, on the left is Mark Bradford's white cube, and on the right is our white cube. And, um, and, these, and these cubes have been, you know, they've been a vehicle through, for, through which the community can reflect upon itself. I mean, and they can see their work in ways, and they see other people go in to see their work, and so on and so forth. And these cubes also became, uh, became locations for, uh, you know, accent points along a, the streets of, uh, of a neighborhood that had no public amenities because it wasn't designed for people to be on the streets. But all the, with all the refugees and immigrants that are there, their lives are not spent getting in their cars, driving out of the neighborhood. They have to find things in the neighborhood. And they spend a lot of time on those streets. So we were trying to figure out how to activate those streets. And it's been a really interesting process. Now, the, the downside of the project is that you know, we, we're suffering from our success. The neighborhood was suffering greatly from, um, uh, from people not wanting to be there. But once we started getting a lot of positive press and people talking about it, all of a sudden the, realist, the property owners started to find an opportunity to reverse. So the rents start going up and so on. So we've, we've kind of scaled our, our operation back and we've shifted it a little bit, but I'm not gonna go into that part of it. But, but this is just, one ex just another example of you know, taking something that is, uh, you know, that's an issue for people and, and it's a point of interest, but figuring out how you actually um, uh, find some, some, some nugget that you can actually re represent it I mean, we present it out into the world in a way that's symbolic and inspiring, and, and, uh, and you can build partnerships among people that help them to continue to grow the efforts that you start with. Now, <clears throat> now the two projects that I've talked about, Project Row Houses on the left and Vickery Meadow to the right, are, are all you know, large kind of community scale projects. But, but I also understand, though, that in reality, the, the, the big change is really important, but it also has to rest upon, you know, what's happening with the people, the individual people, you know, what's, what's going on at the bottom uh, uh, or the, all the little parts of this big change. And so I, I start taking a real interest in looking at individuals and people and trying to figure out, you know, how do you do something similar with people? How do you make that kind of transformative thing uh, for people in their lives? Because people do interesting things. I mean, there's so much inspiration around us if we look and, uh, and, and listen carefully. I mean, these are four individuals that I have uh, interesting relationships with because I just, I admire them. I mean, I, uh, the man on the, uh, on the lower left-hand side, I don't really know his name. But I do know this. I do know that at least once a month, he shows up on his bicycle, with a trash can, uh, broom, sometimes a weed eater, sometimes hand shears, and he just takes care of the lawn there along the bus stop. He just does it, you know, and it's a, it's a, that's a beautiful thing that happens. And so how do you honor that? Uh, the woman on the top, um, uh, she's a woman that pushes her cart through the neighborhood and she makes her extra income by going door to door asking people if, they, if she could do their laundry. And she goes and she puts it in her back, she pushes it back. Uh, the guy on the, on the, uh, the right-hand side, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll show you what he, he does in a little bit, but the woman at the bottom who's really, who's become one of my, I talk about mentors a lot when I talk about my work, and she's an amazing mentor for me because she started in our Young Mothers program as someone who was broken. And she, she managed to actually rebuild her life through our Young Mothers program, went off and got her PhD at Penn State, taught at the University of P Pittsburgh for a few years, came back to our community because she wanted to be a part of the work that we were doing, and, uh, and the mayor actually appointed her as a, uh, a commissioner on the housing authority. And, uh, and you know, she sat there on that board with uh, mostly white men you know, who are developers, and she command her space in that, in that, uh, in that position so well that now the current mayor, uh, uh, newly elected mayor, has appointed her the chair of his housing transition team. And, you know, she's an incredibly powerful person that just kind of remade herself in that way of, 
you know, finding something inspiring in herself. Now, the, the guy with the, the saxophone, though, this is, the others, I'm not, I didn't, I'm not gonna go into the particular works that I've done around them, but this one I'll just show you quickly, <clears throat> that it was just a very simple gesture. He would walk through the neighborhood playing a saxophone often, but there was one thing, at, at one time there were lots of house fires, and he would show up and he would, he would always be at those house fires playing his saxophone. And I kind of took that as a poetic gesture that he was kind of, you know, playing the last song for these buildings that are leaving. And so I just made these images and, and made a, 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 a big poster and did posters throughout the neighborhood as a way of honoring him. Uh, this is the last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna close on this one is that, so this one is really special to me and I talk about this one all the time because uh, uh, Eugene Howard has since passed away, but I had, I had a good maybe 13 years with this person. He showed up around 2000 as someone who had been in prison for some 25 years. And um, uh, he showed up with no family, no one around that he could really um, uh, you know, connect to. The neighborhood had changed completely, but someone pointed him the direction of Project Row Houses. Well, when he came, he would come every he would come every day and just kind of sit around, hang out, and he starts sweeping, cleaning things up, and you know, just making himself useful. And uh, and one day, uh, I was talking to him. Well, and let me just also tell you, he his, he calls himself brother-in-law. Now that's a whole nother story because that's his kind of way of. You see that smile on this guy? You know he has like game, right? So that's so that's so that's his thing. You know, he's like, I, you know, I I will take your sister for my wife if I want to. You know, so, but but that was that was like his little thing. But but there was something else though. He didn't just have game there. There was something genuine in this guy. And uh, and so after a while, I start giving him money to, uh, uh, you know, if he clean up stuff, I'd give him a little money, and he would always show up with a big plate of barbecue. And I would say, well, brother-in-law, I didn't want you to spend it on us. This is just for you. He goes, no, I like, I like doing that. You know, I like cooking. So one day I thought, I said, I wonder what this person would have been like had he had a different life. I mean, a different track, you know? I mean, born in a different place, a different time. And so I asked him, I said, brother-in-law, if you could start over your life, what would you have done with it? You know, what would you have liked to have been? And he says, well, you know, since I like cooking, you know, maybe I would have liked to have a cafe. And I thought, well, that's, that's interesting. And I thought, well, I wonder what he would look like, you know, as the, you know, a, a person who had a cafe. So I went back and I worked some design stuff and came up with this poster of him, right? <laughs> and, and so, so, so we did, the, so we did this poster. So we did this poster as a way of just kind of like the other one, just to share it, to show him in a different light. And it was funny, you know, whatever. But at the same time, also, it was an opportunity for him to, you know, we started to, you know, whenever we were having a group of people come over, we'd get brother-in-law to cook his barbecue, you know. And so he'd kind of start to do these things. And then all of a sudden, it just kind of caught on. You know, he went from, you know, doing little things for us to having, you know, there's t-shirts, there were mugs, and people from all over the city were coming to, you know, they wanted a piece of brother-in-law. And, um, you know, and it was one of those things that, 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 that happened um, uh, very naturally. But I also think it was one of those things that just kind of, to me, it's just, it's just symbolic of the fact that, you know, we have so many treasures around us that we write them off as, as throwaways. I mean, those shotgun houses were written off as, you know, throwaways. They have no value. But now they're setting the, the, the parameters of how we talk about developing our neighborhood. Uh, the, the, the refugees and immigrants in, in Dallas, you know, you know, when I was there, when I started out, I mean, there was, you know, people were just, this is a problem. You know, how do we deal with this? We've, we've, you know, we've gotten ourselves into something that we don't really, uh, we don't feel comfortable with. But how do you take that and you turn it around? You know, and, same, and similarly with, uh, with brother-in-law, you know, it's just taking, trying to find the value in every aspect of our community. And I think that that, to me, is the, is the essence of kind of the social sculpture uh, part, is really finding that value. We all have uh, an opportunity to do it, whether we're artists, whether we're engineers, whether we're, you know, you know, whatever it is that we do, 
we have an opportunity in our lives to really find something that is, a, is of a higher calling, that's not just done for the sake of what it is that we do, but it's also done for the betterment of humanity. And I think that that's, to me, is the most valuable thing about the work that I'm trying to do of pushing the arts into the rim of, uh, of, of the social context. And, uh, and hopefully, the work that I've shown you uh, makes at least some contribution toward that effort. Thank you. <laughs> I, went, I went five minutes over. <laughs> Well, um, uh, greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Diamond. I'm the faculty uh, director of the Haas Center for Public Service. Rick, thank you so much. You have certainly drawn us to a higher uh, calling here tonight, and we're deeply grateful for that illuminating and really inspiring presentation. So we have a bit of time uh, for anyone who wants to ask a question of uh, uh, of Rick or uh, react to what he has presented, sir. If you, we have microphones that we need to use because we're <clears throat> recording this. Thanks, Al Spivak. Uh, what you've done is remarkable in integrating the uh, community and and the cultural backgrounds. What I didn't hear is what is being done with the education of the young kids and bringing in role models to tell them what they can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't go through all the specific uh, aspects of the different programs, but yeah, youth education is like a major, major part. Uh, actually, there were one of those, um, in one of the images I did use, uh, an image uh, when I was talking about, the image about listening, uh, there's a, a group of young people, a cadre of young people that, that uh, work to actually find individual uh, places in the community that they can reclaim. Because the point is for us to, not, that, not for us to do what it is that we're doing for ourselves, but to figure out how we can do it in a way that, that, that connects other people to their own ability to do it. And young people play a huge part of that, of giving them the tools to even start thinking about the possibility of you know, owning property you know, and, and, and actually caring for it. That's a big, big part. So, well, I won't go into the details on that, though. Okay, okay over here. I loved your talk. The word curiosity comes to mind. Mm. I work in public health, and uh, we do, I mean, this is all very public health oriented, mm. but we have a certain agenda that we try to push. And what I noticed about what you've done is this extraordinary curiosity and is that it must be the artist's perspective but it was it was similar to what we do but so different because of your approach and your your open-mindedness and creativity so that's yeah. all i just wanted to comment and yeah. it was fabulous yeah I, you know I, the the curiosity part i think is i mean that's you know to me that's the core of where you know, listening comes in. I mean, I've, I started the conversation about talking about listening, but it's really curiosity that comes before that because it's the curiosity that gets people out of their lane, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and, and, and cause them to want to see what's on the other side of the fence. I often tell people that, you know, I'm, I'm an artist, but I really, I trespass into other fields all the time, right? Because I'm always trying to see, you know, What's over there? What are they doing over there? You know, that's interesting that I can do over here. And that, it's that curiosity that kind of placed you in the, um, uh, in, the, in the mindset that you have to listen. Okay, next over here. Hi. Hi, Flora. Hi, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Flora has like, attached herself to me since I've been here in <laughs> Palo Alto, so. <laughs> okay. Rick, I really wish you could localize what you're talking about for us. 
because you were able to go for a very rare thing in East Palo Alto. And you've seen the barriers to holding on to what's there because of the blight of gentrification. And you've talked about models that go from ghetto out. How do you preserve the ghetto? How do you keep cheap housing available for vibrant communities, for artists, for poor? Um, so I'm wondering, did you have any thoughts after your trip through East Palo Alto? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Rick, I was going to ask you a, a similar question. Are people thinking about this in Houston? Uh, is there any work being done on the kind of economics of sustainably affordable housing? Yeah. Well, you know what? That question is so layered. As a Mark Norman is out here somewhere who does housing finance and all. He, he's probably the one that you should be asking that question to. But I would, but I would say this, though. That the question is so complex because we talk about it in terms of you know East Palo Alto right we, we can talk about it in terms of the third ward in Houston but you know Larry you, in, you, you, we were riding together the other day and we were talking about that same thing in relation mm -hmm. to Stanford mm -hmm. you know where's the I mean you know there's an affordable housing issue here at Stanford huge one. you know for the for the people who uh, work here, you know, they, they, you know, they can't, they don't earn enough to actually live in this, you know, in this community. So it's a, it's a, it's a deep, deep problem uh, that we have in our, in our society. I mean, housing is a major, major problem. Now, the strategies, though, that, that I'm very hopeful about is, um, is, is and, and maybe it'll catch on, but uh, community land trusts, where we can actually put property aside and put it in places where the community can uh, owns the property and it continues to to be, be affordable for that purpose. But but that's a but that's a that's a that's a tough one. I mean that's going to be a tough one. So I, I'm I'm watch I'm you know my listening uh, I'm listening on all levels. That's why it's interesting to be in East Palo Alto to listen to the how they're dealing with it. It's been really interesting being here at Stanford to start thinking about Stanford having an affordable housing issue. You know, because people don't really, wouldn't even really think of that. You know, but there is a, you know, so anyway. I don't have the answer. So, sorry. <laughs> if you could just wait for the mic, everyone will be able to hear you. What your talk made me think about, I mean, a similar uh, academic area related to public health, is when we do things, people want to know whether it's effective. They want to evaluate it. I think your artist sensibility, you know, you show, the, you show the visuals, you show the pictures, and it has an impact. But, you know, I, I think that's something we all have to come to grips with. And I, I'm curious whether people have asked you, well, did you evaluate whether this you know, accomplish this, that, or the other, because unless we, you evaluate it, we can't invest in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually, a, that's a very good question, and that's a, and that's a challenge for the whole uh, arts and community engagement um, uh, field right now. And, and, and it's, a, it's a valid question, but it's a tough one, because, it, you know, there was a review, someone reviewed uh, wrote a, crit a critique of the term that's used to talk about artists and do in community engaged work. <clears throat> he base and he used Project Row Houses as the uh, as the basically the, the the punching bag, and uh, which was fine with me because I I mean I thought it was good criticism. But his criticism was that you know okay so if if you know, if Project Row House is supposed to be one of the best things going in terms of this, you know, artists doing community engaged work, and one of the things that Project Row House addresses is housing, he says, well, the last time I've checked, uh, the city of Houston has, you know, a housing problem of tens of thousands of units of housing, and they've only done, you know, 80 something. And, uh, you know, which is, a, which is a good critique, right? If you want to, if you want to, Evaluate it based on scale, on numbers, and looking at that aspect of impact. But I think there's another. I, I think that when you reduce the arts 
to trying to compete with, as far as Project Earth is, if we're trying to compete with home builders, we lose the magic of our work. Our work is no longer inspirational. It is, we'd have to end up producing the sluck of housing that people are just producing just to get uh, uh, units on the ground. And that's not our interest. Our interest is to create housing that, is, that serves inspirational, you know, and that, that gives us something to work toward as opposed to, you know, going down to the level of just being, you know, can we get our production level up? Yeah, I just want to comment. I agree with you. I'm saying that what a, we should be doing other things to show, you know, the, the positive aspects of the kind of work you do instead of the traditional evaluation. And I, I think, you know, showing the visuals and telling the stories is a good start. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all the way in back. Thank you so much. This is a great talk. Um, really inspiring. And I wanted to ask, how do you fund these amazing projects? Because that's always a question with socially inspiring work and um, public service work. Uh, just because uh, a lot of times when it's not framed as a research project or as a traditional, traditional path toward a solution, people are a little bit wary. But there's, I know there's a, there's a space opening up in foundations that are they're more interested in like innovative and new ideas. So can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, there's fundraising. You know, you just, you have to raise funds and so on and so forth, which, which I, you know, as a project sustains itself, that's, that, you know, you can't get around it. But I always, but I tell people though, I mean, I only show you, you know, a few projects, but there are other projects that I'm working on that have, you know, less funding, less resources. And so what I, what I always try to get people to think about is to think about, instead of thinking about funding, think about resources. You know, what are the resources that we have? So there may be a situation where you may not have money, but you may have people, you know, and, or you, you may have, you know, uh, uh, access to, you, you know, you, you may not have a building, but you have access to partners that have buildings and so on and so forth. So, I, you know, there's bottom line is there's all funding is always an issue and you have to fundraise and that's a big big part of it but I really encourage people to think about resourcing and how do you resource what it is that you're doing okay I think this may be the last question go ahead we'll see if we have time for one more after this right right here oh, well, well, well I, we got to do the most yeah we'll take you both how's that and we'll, <laughs> well, we'll uh, close with you okay <laughs> I would like to frame the question uh, that was asked about affordable housing in another way. And uh, I'm wondering, there seems to be forces and counter forces in life like the thesis and the antithesis. And I'm wondering if as an artist you have run into that where you step out to do something. It's something good and then there's the counter force that comes along that you have to deal with constantly. And if you found that in your work and if you've developed some way of dealing with the counter, the forces, the counter forces, hmm. the thesis, the antithesis that supposedly leads to a, a new synthesis. Hmm. Well, generally I try to move away from them. You know, if they, you know, I mean, if I see them, I want to get out of their way. I mean, that's, you know, that's the first thing. You try, you know, if it's coming, to, and then the second thing is to figure out, you know, if it can find some way that it's not, you know, that it's not all what it seems. You know, because sometimes, you know, there, you know, when things come at you and immediately it seems like it's something that is adversarial or doesn't quite fit, there may be some benefits, you know, around the edge. So try, and that's, and to me, that's that explore, that's to me is the exciting part, though. You know, the explore the exploration of trying to figure out, you know, how does this thing look if we turn it like this? And that's, a, that's, that's training from art. You know, for the artists in here, you know that, right? You know that's part of the training, is that, you know, you, you try something like this and you go, oh, but that didn't work. Let's try it like this. You know, and you try it like that. And you just constantly, you're not afraid to move things around and shift things around and try, you know, in different ways. And that's, you know, that's, 
that's part of the beauty of doing social and community engaged work because you get to participate in that and you get to learn, you get to know things about people. So it's, uh, so I, I take it as, you know, generally I take them all as opportunities. Okay, and our last opportunity is there. <laughs> Um, I wanted to pick up on the, on the conversation about impact, measuring impact, and uh, wonder if you've thought about how you might measure inspiration or the value of all these more um, symbolic and poetic qualities. It's almost creating a new, I think that's maybe what the other uh, question asker was, was getting at, is how do we measure that? I mean, there's the happiness index, but I, I just wonder if there's a way, an exploration opportunity in how how to capture the value of that in yeah. some way that can be translated to people uh, in a new way then. Yeah. Well, so there's one of those adversarial things you say, right? <laughs> you know, it's like coming at me at that angle. It's like, oh, no, I can't quite figure that one out. Let's see if we can go around the side. Because, because, because you know, when I, when I think about that, I, I think about it in two ways. On the one hand, I think of the work that I do as art, you know, there's all of my artistic intention is in it. And we never, we never try to reduce the value of art in that way, right? I mean, you know, we, we can't go to the museum and say, you know, so what is the value of that Monet on the life of people? It's like, you know, because it has so many different layers and it's so murky. But then on the other side, though, from the, from the you know, the, the, the social side of the social impact side, then there is, a, there is that question of, you know, how do you determine, you know, whether that, you know, whether it has value, you know, and how do you, you know, measure that, that value? And, um, you know, and, you know, for me, I, I, I think a lot of it is, is intuitive for me, and I kind of feel it through the energy of the, of the project. I mean, and you can always kind of test things as to whether they're moving well or not. You know, through, I, I look at all the index around. I mean, are funders interested in it? You know, if funders are not interested in it, you might think, well, that's one thing that might say, man, maybe it's not whatever. Are people, you know, attending things or are they contributing, helping in ways, whatever? I mean, there are all these different elements that go into it that I start to, that, that weigh on me, that I weigh them out, you know, to determine whether they have, have value. Now, how do I, you know, put that in the, uh, uh, you know, kind of bottle that up in a, in a way that, you know, allows, you know, people to use it in an objective way, I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, uh, that's basically the, you know, that's, that's the approach that I use. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Before we close, uh, I just do want to thank um, all of the staff, too numerous to mention, of the Haas Center for Public Service for the extraordinary job they've done uh, starting weeks and weeks and weeks in advance to prepare this memorable event. And I also want to thank, um, really, you know, there's no better friend on campus to public service at Stanford and to our new Cardinal Service Initiative than the person who started this program, our Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education, Harry Elam. Thank you, Harry, so much for your support. And Rick, one last time, you really are an inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming.